world is running out of energy. Power cuts and blackouts are an international phenomenon. Factories are shutting, economies are suffering. This is a painful transition. We are trying to move away from fossil fuels, but we don't have enough green alternatives. So what do we do? Do we turn to nuclear energy? Is nuclear energy the solution to climate change? Well, Europe certainly thinks so. Ten European countries want nuclear energy to be declared green energy. They're dealing with a major crisis, you must know this. Winter is coming and Europe does not have power. They depend on Russia for natural gas, but Russia refuses to help them. Putin is holding supplies hostage. So Europeans, with their back against the wall, are talking about the nuclear option. On Gravitas tonight, as we discuss the power crisis and the power play, we'll tell you why the nuclear pivot cannot be a political decision. Also on the show, China has launched another closed probe on the pandemic. This time it will test thousands of blood samples from Wuhan. North Korea's Kim says he's building what he calls an invincible military. You don't want to miss the images from his self-defense exhibition. In Pakistan, Prime Minister Imran Khan has reportedly taken on the army chief over the appointment of the new ISI chief. As expected, it's not going well. And is this another sign of life in outer space? Scientists report receiving extraordinary signals from the heart of the Milky Way. We'll tell you all about it. We begin, as always, with Gravitas Global Headlines. India strongly rejects China's objection to a visit by Vice President M. Venkaya Naidu to Arunachal Pradesh, asserting that the state is an integral and inalienable part of India. This comes amid deadlock in talks over disengagement at the line of actual control in eastern Ladakh. The Serbian government terms Kosovo Prime Minister Albin Kurti a psychopath, asks NATO-led forces to intervene after clashes between Kosovo police and ethnic Serbs leaves several people injured. The group of 20 agrees to work together to avoid a humanitarian disaster in Afghanistan, which is witnessing soaring food prices and unemployment. The G20 leaders agree that they will need to maintain dialogue with the Taliban. Democrats in the U.S. House of Representatives approve a $480 billion hike in the government's borrowing limit, avoiding a historic default which would have devastated the U.S. economy. The hike will cover the U.S. till early December. Alibaba founder Jack Ma reportedly met with business associates in recent days in Hong Kong after being largely absent from the public eye since China's regulatory crackdown on his business empire last year. Kenya rejects in totality the International Court of Justice's ruling in favor of Somalia in a long dispute over a maritime border. Kenya is concerned that the decision regarding a potentially oil and gas rich chunk may have implications for the region. Russian President Vladimir Putin stresses on the need to speed up vaccinations as the country recorded its highest daily death toll since the start of the pandemic. Russia recorded more than 970 Covid-linked deaths in the past 24 hours. Tropical storm Kompasu forces the Hong Kong Stock Exchange to cancel all trading sessions and shut down the stock market. Schools and government services were also shut down amid fears of flooding in low-lying areas. India have added bowling all-rounder Shardul Thakur to their 15-man squad for this month's T20 World Cup, while spinner Aksar Patel has dropped to the standbys. Thakur's inclusion is seen as a cover for Hardik Pandya, who did not bowl a single ball in the UAE leg of the IPL. Thakur has taken 18 wickets in 16 games for IPL finalists Chennai Super Kings this season at an economy of 8.75 per over. Denmark have become the second team after Germany to qualify for the 2022 FIFA World Cup. Joachim Mähle's lone goal saw the Euro 2020 semi-finalists Austria 1-0 for their eighth win from eight games in Group F. Denmark have an unassailable seven-point lead and are the only team to have not conceded a single goal in this qualifying campaign. Have you heard about the nuclear apocalypse? 
It's a Cold War legend. Superpowers would drop nukes around the world. Everything and everyone would perish, basically the end of times. There were two villains in this legend, the superpowers and nuclear power. Nuclear power is the most villainized energy source in the world, and rightly so. Nuclear power made weapons of mass destruction, what we saw in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Nuclear power also led to massive disasters like Fukushima and Chernobyl. So for decades, nuclear meant only one thing, flashing red lights and danger signs. But today there's a rethink. Could nuclear energy solve climate change? Is nuclear energy the perfect fuel? European countries certainly think so. They're reeling under a major energy crisis. Natural gas prices have shot through the roof in Europe almost 600,000, 600%, 600% up. Europe's solar and wind farms have been hit by erratic weather and their biggest supply is playing hardball. That's Russia, by the way. And here's something you must know. 90% of Europe's natural gas comes from outside, 43% from Russia. Now they're suffering a severe shortage. But President Vladimir Putin of Russia is in no mood to help. He has refused to ship more natural gas to the EU. He has refused to replenish their storage sites. Why? Because politics. And there's nothing new here. He who controls energy is king in geopolitics. We saw it with West Asian oil, and we're seeing it with Russian natural gas. President Putin is using the energy crisis as leverage over Europe. Leverage for what? What does Putin want? He wants rapid approval for a key gas pipeline. It is called Nord Stream 2. Now this pipeline will run from Russia to Germany through the Baltic Sea bed. The work is done. Only the final approval is awaited. And this is Putin's way of giving Europe a nudge, holding them hostage more like. Europe can blame Putin all they want, but the fact is they messed up too. Europe's green transition is far from perfect. So President Putin says, your policy, your problem. The rise in gas prices in Europe was a consequence of the power shortage and not vice versa. And there is no need to shift the blame onto others, as some of our partners are trying to do. Over the past decade, step by step, systemic flaws have been laid in the European energy sector. It was this which led to a large-scale market crisis in Europe. So what's the lesson from this energy crisis? Our traditional sources remain a political minefield like oil and natural gas and our green alternatives remain volatile like solar and wind energy. So what do we do? Well, Europe is going the nuclear way. Ten EU countries have written a letter to the European Commission. These are the countries, France, Bulgaria, Croatia, the Czech Republic, Finland, Hungary, Poland, Slovakia, Slovenia and Romania. Ten countries, what do they want? They want nuclear power to be recognized as green power. It's controversial stuff. The EU announced a list of green sources in April last year. It had solar power, it had wind power, geothermal power, but no nuclear power. So why is there a rethink now? Because France wants it. France is pushing for it. 70% of electricity in France comes from nuclear power. President Macron wants to export this model. He wants Europe to embrace the nuclear option. We absolutely must prepare for technologies that break away from traditional ones and for deep transformation in nuclear. The promise of what we call small modular reactors, small reactors that are more adaptable and safer, since safety is a key point in the nuclear debate. Technologies to better handle our waste, on some of which progress is being made and some we haven't even thought of yet. And here lie efforts on research that for some are already very advanced. Does Europe agree with Macron? Well, not really. There is a strong anti-nuclear movement in Europe. Germany, for instance, plans to shut all reactors by 2022. Austria, Luxembourg, Spain, Denmark, they all share Germany's position. So the EU is divided on nuclear energy, I would say much like the rest of the world. Divided. Can you really count on nuclear power as a green alternative? Let's try and look at both sides. Nuclear power is created through a process called fission, basically splitting uranium atoms. This creates a lot of energy, and I mean an insane amount of energy. So advantage number one, there is no carbon emission. There is no burning, there is no smoke. Advantage number two, a smaller footprint, smaller land footprint. A 1,000 megawatt nuclear power plant requires one square mile to operate. 
Compare that to wind power, 360 times more land. Solar power, 75 times more land. So does this mean it's time to go nuclear? Well, not yet. You see, pollution is not just about carbon emissions. Nuclear waste is equally, if not more, problematic. It remains hazardous for tens of thousands of years. And what if it spills? We're looking at a massive nuclear disaster then. The next problem is cost. Nuclear reactors are not cheap. It's easy for France to build them. But what about small island nations like the Maldives or Kiribati? How can they afford these nuclear projects? And I'll show you the price difference. One kilowatt of solar energy costs $1,000. One kilowatt of nuclear energy costs $6,500 to $12,250. Anywhere between that. So we must guard against this greenwashing of nuclear energy. This nuclear baptism. It's an easy way out for developed countries. They have the money, they have the know-how, and they have the experience. But remember, climate change affects the entire planet not just France and company. Some experts suggest using nuclear fuel as a bridge, like a temporary source during the green transition. But let me tell you this, there is nothing temporary about nuclear energy. The plants take years to build, and their waste lies around for a quarter of a million years. That's a tall price for a temporary fix. I know that nuclear power seems exciting, no emissions, almost unlimited power, but are we going out of the frying pan into the fire? Well, only scientists, frankly, can answer this question. We ignored their advice once and look where we are. So let scientists decide on the nuclear pivot, not politicians. Until then, focus on the sources we know to be safe, like the sun and the wind. Now to another headline we've been tracking for a while. Is China going to at attack Taiwan? I know it's a question that we ask all the time. It's a question we've been asking too frequently of late. And that's because the threat is growing with every passing day. Just look at what the Chinese soldiers have been up to. First, they sent 150 planes to invade Taiwanese airspace. And now they're practicing how to fight on an island. The PLA released a video this week. It shows a military drill and looks like it's part of some Hollywood blockbuster. You have to look at this. Ignore the bad music in the background. I want you to pay attention to what the Chinese soldiers were doing here. They practiced storming a beach. They were throwing smoke grenades, breaking through barbed wire, digging trenches in the sand. Where do you think they'll need all of these skills? In Taiwan. Focus on the location. This is the southern part of China's Fujian province. It is right opposite Taiwan. This region is extremely important for Chinese soldiers. That's because whenever China decides to strike Taiwan, Fujian would serve as a launching site. The PLA is getting battle ready here. Even as their president, Xi Jinping, talks about peace, he keeps harping on a peaceful reunification of Taiwan. But there's nothing peaceful about the actions of his army. They have put together an entire playbook to conquer Taiwan. The invasion could play out through four military campaigns, we have a copy of what the Chinese are planning to do. Campaign number one involves using the Chinese Air Force. The PLA could launch missiles and airstrikes to disarm the Taiwanese. The first targets would be Taiwan's military and government. Then the PLA could go after the civilians. And with this campaign, the Chinese hope to force Taipei to submit to Chinese demands. Sounds easy, may not be in practice. Campaign number two will be a blockade operation. This is how it works. China tries to cut off Taiwan from the rest of the world. The PLA launches a range of attacks from naval raids to cyber attacks. The idea is to block key supplies from reaching Taiwan and disconnect communication. Campaign number three, target American troops. Under this plan, the PLA conducts airstrikes on US forces deployed near Taiwan. Why would Chinese forces attack the Americans? Because that would ultimately weaken the Taiwanese defense. It would be harder for American troops to help out Taiwan. And if that happens, China will have a free run on Taiwan. 
And this would lead to campaign number four, an amb amphibious assault on Taiwan, just like the video that, that we just saw. The Chinese forces landing on Taiwanese terrain. They might go after the offshore islands first. Then the PLA launches a phased operation to take Taiwan. They could even choose to carpet bomb Taiwan's army, navy and the air force. These are all scenarios that the Chinese are looking at. But the big picture is clear. They're looking at invading. They're looking at attacking. The option of a military offensive is very much on the table. That is the message. That is clear. China's military planners would have hesitated to even pitch the idea of a war in the past, but not anymore. China is now openly threatening Taiwan. Beijing says its military moves are quote-unquote necessary and just. The People's Liberation Army exercises are necessary actions to defend national sovereignty and territorial integrity. The actions targeted at Taiwan independence, separatist activities and interference by external forces. The purpose is to fundamentally safeguard the overall interests of the Chinese nation and the vital interests of people on both sides of the strait. China's loyal friends have backed Beijing's stand. Russia, in no uncertain terms, has declared that Taiwan belongs to China. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov issued a statement. I have it with me. This is what it says. Russia, like the overwhelming majority of other countries, considers Taiwan to be part of the People's Republic of China. We have proceeded and will proceed from this premise on our foreign policy. What about America? The Biden administration believes that China is not just intimidating Taiwan, it is pressurizing allies to withdraw support to the island. Washington has warned Beijing against any future misadventures. The PRC has stepped up efforts to intimidate and pressure Taiwan and other allies and partners, including increasing their military activities uh, conducted in the vicinity of Taiwan, the East China Sea and the South China Sea, which we believe are destabilizing and only increase the risk of mis miscalculation. Our support for and defense relationship with Taiwan remains aligned against the current threat posed by the People's Republic of China, and we urge Beijing to honor its commitment to the peaceful resolution of cross-strait differences as delineated in the three communiques. Will China heed to this warning? Highly unlikely. The PLA refuses to back down. The Biden administration is running out of moves. It is desperately trying to hold, to avoid rather, a military face-off with China. But if tensions continue to escalate, America could find itself pulled into a new theater of conflict. And it's been a while since we discussed the Wuhan virus, more specifically the hunt for the origins of the Wuhan virus. Now, a new round of investigation is about to begin. And once again, China is the one dictating the terms to the World Health Organization. China is in the dock over the virus origin story. And yet China continues to dictate terms. Several original investigators have been retained in this new probe, even after they delivered a compromised report in the last investigation. And Beijing is also denying access to the evidence that could expose its cover-up. Nothing new there, but this is what China is up to. A new chapter is about to begin in the hunt for the Wuhan virus origins. But this mission too is a charade. Once again, the World Health Organization is failing its members. It has created a new scientific advisory group to probe the origins. It's a new team with old faces. Several investigators who traveled to Wuhan still remain on the job, like Marian Kupmans, Pia Fischer and Hung Nguyen. They were part of the team that said a lab leak was the least likely possibility. A conclusion that was rejected by global experts, they demanded more transparency from China. WHO member states called for a second round of investigation. It has begun, but it's more of the same charade. China is testing blood samples from Wuhan, but China won't let any foreign investigators touch the samples. We're talking about some 200,000 blood samples. They were taken between October and November 2019. These samples could help in pinpointing when the virus jumped to humans. Beijing will not let foreign scientists investigate these samples. Chinese experts will conduct the testing. 
international experts will only be allowed to watch. That's progress, considering how China is blocking access to its caves. You can't even watch them. We're talking about the infamous bat caves that China won't let any foreigner enter. Also the nearby wildlife farms. These farms collect and house hundreds of wild mammals like civets, ferret, badgers and raccoon dogs. These animals can be the intermediate hosts for the Wuhan virus. The World Health Organization wanted access to these farms. China refused. China is in the dock for the pandemic's origin and spread. Yet China continues to dictate the terms of investigation. And the World Health Organization continues to play ball. That's the new investigation in a nutshell. Don't hold your breath for the result. Bureau Report, we own. World is one. Now let's tell you what's happening in North Korea. But before we play out the story for you, here's a bit of advice. Don't try any of this at home or outside for that matter. Don't try it. North Korea, we know, is a country that makes headlines for bizarre or dangerous developments. A country where one man rules 25 million people. His whims are the law. He makes his subjects do irrational things. Like what? Let's let the pictures do the talking. You saw that. There's more. Men break through layers of bricks. One man runs in and smashes his head on them. Others have rods smashed on their bodies, followed by some hammering on their hands. Then one man smashes two glass bottles together, adds them to a pile of shards and lies on them shirtless. All of this while the Supreme Leader sits and grins with his ministers. This was not an episode of North Korea's Got Talent. This was Kim Jong-un telling the world to not mess with his country. The footage we showed you was aired on the North Korean state media. They say it was a message for their enemies. North Korean soldiers have quote-unquote iron fists to protect their country. I'm sure they do. But the level of self-harm they inflicted here makes you wonder if North Korea needs enemies at all. Also, who exactly are these people? Are they super soldiers? That's what social media is calling them. They're certainly extraordinary. Some say they're enhanced fighters, that they have been genetically engineered. No, says North Korea, they're not. Their strength, the government says, was, and I'm quoting, their strength was bestowed upon them by their leader Kim Jong-un. It's hard to argue with them. The North Korean propaganda machine beats Hollywood in imagination. It says Kim Jong-un can bend time and space. So bestowing strength seems like par for the course for him. And it gets more interesting. This pain-defying display was followed by a weapons exhibition. Weapons which Kim Jong-un said were meant for quote-unquote self-defense. And that's another lie, unless we've got the definition of self-defense wrong. Let me tell you what the weapons are. Intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBMs, including the Hwasong-16. It's the largest ICBM in North Korea's arsenal. Also on display was a range of military hardware, tanks, rocket launchers, armored trucks, all of which Kim insisted repeatedly were meant for self-defense. Allow me to quote from a speech. This is what Kim Jong-un says. We are not discussing war with anyone, but rather to prevent war itself and to literally increase war deterrence for the protection of national sovereignty. That's his... That's his excuse for what he's been doing. How do you perceive the statement? 
North Korea is banned from testing ballistic missiles by the United Nations, but it continues to flout the ban. As a result, it is heavily sanctioned. Critical supplies like food and fuel have been cut off. The U.S. says it will relax sanctions only if North Korea gives up nuclear weapons. But Kim Jong-un won't budge. What's he trying to achieve here? What's the point of this muscle flexing when your country is starving and suffering? Well, Kim is a classic dictator. He hopes to achieve two things. One, distract his country through such show of strength, distract people from economic distress and make them talk about perceived threats. And two, he's trying to tell his critics that they're hypocrites, that they're framing North Korea as a threat while stockpiling weapons themselves. Hard to argue with that. And this was evident in his remarks. He criticized the Biden administration. He said that they're sponsoring South Korea's arms buildup. Let me quote again from what Kim said. I wonder if there's any person or state who believes in its claim that the U.S. is not hostile to the DPRK and if any, I'm curious to know who they are. This is rhetoric and bluster from a leader of a hermit kingdom who knows that his weapons are his only insurance policy against the West and his people are fodder in this power game. Pakistan's army chief, General Kamar Javed Bajwa, belongs to the same league of leaders, you could say. He can make the entire civilian government of Pakistan bend to his will. Recently, Imran Khan dared to defy General Bajwa. He blocked the appointment of the new ISI chief. Imran Khan wanted the existing director general to stay on. Bajwa decided to put the selected prime minister in his place. Our next report tells you what happened next. Imran Khan dared to take on his boss. He openly defied General Kamar Javed Bajwa, only to end up with an egg on his face. The controversy is about this man, Lieutenant General Faiz Hamid. He is the Director General of Pakistan's spy agency, the ISI. Not too long ago, Lieutenant General Hamid was seen at this hotel in Kabul. He was taking a victory lap before the reporters after the Taliban's takeover of Afghanistan. Apparently, Hamid's sudden appearance didn't sit well with General Bajwa. Within weeks, a shake-up was executed. Lieutenant General Hamid was issued his transfer orders. The Pakistani army announced he would leave his post at the ISI. Hamid was to take charge as the commander of the Peshawar Corps. Bajwa chose Lieutenant General Nadeem Anjum to lead the ISI. But Imran Khan's office blocked that transfer. It was direct defiance of General Bajwa's orders. The Pakistani army chief didn't take it well. Prime Minister was promptly reined in. Reports say General Bajwa met with Imran Khan. He was told not to interfere in military matters. Apparently, Imran Khan wanted Hamid to stay. He believes the situation in Afghanistan is critical and now is not the time for change. But word of his defiance got out. Now, both Imran Khan and General Bajwa are trying to control the damage. Here's the compromise they've struck. Hamid gets to stay on as ISI chief till November. Imran Khan sent one of his ministers before the press to scout reports of a rift. General Bajwa और प्राइम मिनिस्टर साहब के आपस में बहुत ही करीबी और बहुत ही खुशगवार ताल्लुकात हैं और ये पाकिस्तान की जो एक तारीख है उस ज़मन में भी बहुत अहम है कि पाकिस्तान के सिविल और मिलिट्री के दरमियान एक बहुत आइडियल ताल्लुकात है द पाकिस्तानी गवर्नमेंट सेज द हंट फॉर अ न्यू आई एस आई चीफ इज ऑन बट इमरान खान फाइन सिम सेल्फ ऑन अ स्टिकी विकेट ही हैज स्टार्टेड अ फाइट विद द पाकिस्तानी आर्मी चीफ and history shows it never ends well for the prime minister in pakistan the prime minister does not cross the army chief will imran khan get away with the penalty or will he be bowled out with this one the game is still on bureau report we on world is one
And here's a story for science buffs. The heart of the Milky Way galaxy, also known as the galactic center, is emitting some unusual radio waves, extraordinary signals that are unlike anything known to mankind. They've been discovered by a team of scientists at the University of Sydney. The scientists say these signals are beyond their understanding and that they're not coming from a star or a planet, but from a new kind of celestial object. The story is truly puzzling. The question is, could this be a new sign of life in outer space? Here's a report on what we know so far. The center of the Milky Way galaxy is too distant for us to visit in person. But we can still explore it through telescopes. They give us a chance to see what goes on in the unknown, or what's coming out of it. In 2020, when the Wuhan virus began poisoning the world, a team of scientists at the University of Sydney set out on one such exploration. They began surveying the Milky Way, looking for the secrets it is hiding. Their quest has led them to something extraordinary. They've detected unusual signals coming from the center of the Milky Way galaxy. What kind of signals? Radio waves that are unlike anything known to mankind. They fit no understood pattern of a variable radio source. Instead, they point at a new kind of stellar object. According to the lead scientist of this study, the strangest property of this new signal is that it has a very high polarization. This means its light oscillates in only one direction, but that direction rotates with time. Confused? Don't worry, so are the scientists. They say they've never seen anything like it. At first, they thought it was a pulsar, a type of spinning dead star or else a type of star that emits huge solar flares. But the signals they've received don't match any existing criterion. So where are these signals coming from? No one knows. How frequently are they coming? The scientists received at least six signals over nine months in 2020 alone. Each time they tried to find the source, each time they ended up with nothing. So, with the mystery unresolved, the scientists have now made their findings public, hoping that some genius somewhere would be able to solve it for them. Bureau Report, we on. World is one. The wonders of space, it keeps amazing you. Do you remember when you first learned about it, about space, about the solar system, about the whole thing? Probably it's cool, probably from a book, and that's what I want to talk about, books. They have been endlessly romanticized. Rainy day, make some coffee and pick a good book. Alone at home, find company in your favorite novel. That's what we say. Here's what I'm trying to say. Reading is like any other habit. It depends a lot on the setting, on your mood. The question is, how do you set that mood? How do you make people want to read? Let me show you what Norway has done. What you see is their public library, an emphasis on the word public. This library is in the city of Oslo. It's completely free. You can just walk in from the streets. There is only one rule, lights out by 10 p.m. I know what you're thinking, 10 p.m., who needs that much time in the library? But trust me, in this library, you would. You would need all the time in the world. It's got a wine bar, fun study places, reading nooks cafes to take a break, a music studio with drums and guitars, a workshop with 3D printers, and if you're still not impressed, you will be now. Look at the view from the library. The terrace opens up to the waterfront. It's a great place to see the sunset. This year, the Oslo Public Library was voted the best library in the world by the IFLA. That's the Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. Frankly, it's an easy pick. On most days, this library is packed. The normal ca capacity is 3,000 people. Thanks to the Wuhan virus, it's now down to 1,000. There is an important lesson to be learned from this project. Stacking books on a shelf does not create a library, at least not anymore. You must make the reader feel welcome. You must make them stay longer, and most importantly, make them pick up the book, any book. This library does exactly that. It offers a wholesome experience. It becomes an exciting 
trip to look forward to. Unfortunately, that's not the case everywhere. In most countries, a trip to the public library is a different kind of adventure. You must navigate through dusty shelves, make sense of the distorted arrangements, and finally deal with the disinterested librarian. Trust me, it's an ordeal. And these bad experiences discourage people from reading. Not everyone can buy books all the time. So what's the solution? To answer this question, we must look at how public libraries are structured. How do they run? Most public libraries have four basic characteristics. They use tax money, they serve the public interest, they're open to all, and they're free. This is the plus point of a public library. It, runs, it is run by the government, for us, the public. Unfortunately, that's also the downside. Most governments do not spend enough on public libraries. They do not consider it to be a priority. I'll give you the example of India. In rural areas, there is one library for 11,500 people. In urban areas, one for 80,000 people. 80,000. India spends, you won't believe it, India spends 0 0.07 rupees per capita on public libraries. That's seven pesos, 0 0.07 rupees. I won't even bother converting it to dollars. This is simply not enough and you don't need me to tell you that. Governments need to prioritize public libraries. And this must happen at the local government level. I'm talking about investments, upgrading infrastructure, hiring more employees, buying more books, developing that culture. Reading should not be mechanical, it must be organic. When people think about their evening plans, their weekend plans, does a li library ever feature on the list? It should. That is the reading culture we need. And this is not a new idea. How a place looks has a direct impact on its efficiency. I can give you an example. Have you ever wondered why hospitals are increasingly looking like hotels? A big lobby, a front desk. The idea is to remove the fear factor. Most people hate going to the hospital. A dull building will only make matters worse. The same thought applies here. Public libraries are key building blocks of society not just to read books, but to meet your peers, discuss important matters, basically shape your worldview. The decay of public libraries is a decay of reading. And I'm not saying build an Oslo-like library in every city, that's not even possible, frankly. But at the very least, libraries must be welcoming. They must inspire you to pick up a book. On that note, it's a wrap. We're leaving you with Gravitas Images. Thanks for watching. have deployed and here we come new shepherd that's unlike anything you'll ever feel and capsule touch <laughs> captain kirk himself the great william shatner day action Defense two, defense to the right. That's it. High to the left. Oh, very good. 